talk is uh, Unleashing the Power of ECA. If that's not what you're here to learn about, you're in the wrong place. Uh, so if you can figure it out. If you have no idea what ECA is about, that's what we're here to kind of introduce and go over what ECA is, uh, how, why you should use it. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Starshot. I uh, actually think this is a good fit for that. Um, and then basically go through some examples of how we've been using ECA to solve just problems that we used to do, custom modules in the past or in earlier versions with rules, stuff like that. So that's essentially what we're covering today. Uh, my name is John and I have a company, Freelock in Seattle, and we consult with a bunch of different uh, clients and nonprofit and government and uh, education. And, and so these are, these are things that we have learned using ECA and being uh, not, not the earliest adopters, but certainly uh, have been pretty active with it for a year, year and a half now. So first off, what is ECA? Uh, ECA is kind of a replacement for rules, is the way that we think about it. And after talking with Jurgen, it sounded like that was exactly the motivation uh, of it. Um, it's events, conditions, actions is what it stands for. And, uh, and it's built, uh, unlike rules, it has a graphical visual uh, interface for drawing things. It's not the only way that you can do it. There is kind of an old school interface that is more like rules, but BPMN is a business process model not uh, notation. It's a, something that's in be being used by projects other than ECA. It comes from the community. Um, there's a, a bunch of other software packages that are starting to adopt this as a modeling tool. Uh, and it makes it uh, really apparent what's happening uh, in, your, in your model. Um, so, yeah. So let's uh, take a look at it a little bit. So it's a visual representation with uh, connections that are far easier to understand at a glance. Uh, one of the things that we really like about ECA is how you can build documentation in, in a bunch of different places. Uh, for You can add notes to the models, you can add uh, documentation to each of the elements. Uh, and then it's built on a bunch of core systems. It's uh, built on event subscribers, core action plugin. Uh, basically, if, if these things are defined in the system, ECA can use them. Um, it does have its own plugins for events and conditions, um, but there's a, whole, a huge amount of stuff that is already out there that's fully compatible with ECA, and you can just start using it. Uh, another thing we like about it is uh, you can reuse models across projects. There's an export functionality. You can export from one site. It'll bundle up a lot of config with that, that and then you can import it on a different site. So it'll pull over views and uh, content types and stuff like that uh, into another site. So in some ways, it does what Features was trying to do back in Drupal 6 and 7 days. Uh, and then just the browser industry adoption of the kind of the modeling tool. Here's, uh, I think, our most complex model, a screenshot of, of it, uh, of a membership application. And we'll take a little bit of a look at it uh, in a bit. But uh, first, I wanted to bring up Starshot. Uh, not the best slide. I was doing the best I could with my camera there <laughs> yesterday. Um, but if you take a look at it, uh, the no code section here ECA checks all the boxes uh, except for one. I'd say the one that it does not check. Anybody? Yeah, okay. It uh, needs Drupal knowledge. Uh, the one thing that I would say about ECA is it is something that it, you know was built by developers and you need to understand a lot of the extension points of Drupal currently to make effective use of it. Uh, and so if you think of hooks and events, uh, those are the things that hook into ECA. And a lot of what happens as you go into the model is dependent on what you started with. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that right now I wouldn't say it's quite ready. It hasn't quite hit uh, the star shot yet, but it's close. It checks all the rest of the boxes today. We've done 
you know, the, that membership application process with no lines of custom code. It was all config and views and content moderation and ECA. Okay, so I was at a, conf at a conference, DrupalCon 2024, and I uh, get an email from a client that we have a, they're a yacht club, and they have sent me an email saying, hey, uh, this work slip reservation system that we're doing, it's, a, it's not letting admins save. We did a conflict resolution uh, using ECA. And so, is this something that you can address? Well, so we're kind of a DevOps shop. We don't necessarily advise doing work on production. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> In this room of 90, 100 people, what could go wrong? <laughs> Let's see, what can we do here? So this model here, just to give you an idea, I thought I'd make a, a nice fitting example. The reservation form validate is the event that it hooks into. It loads a, the selected slip value from a form field. It loads a, a slip, it's a content type, and um, gets the start date and end date and the slip number off of that. And a couple of paths here. One is validating that it's not longer than three days. The other is loading up a view and is passing in as arguments to the view the uh, slip number, the start date, and the end date, and the view returns a list of reservations that match that are already in the system. So if there's more than one of those, it does a form set error, basically, and rejects, the, rejects it. And that's what's happening on this site right now. So, uh, well, I guess uh, right here, let's just see if we can do it. We can drop in a new action, and that's gonna go in the wrong spot. Um, so I'm gonna say, uh, is not admin, and change this connector to go out of that and add a new connector. And this is essentially what using ECA looks like. So I'm gonna say uh, role as okay. So there's a token browser. It's been a little while since I've looked at this particular one. So what we want to do is get the current user, actually, and I'm doing this wrong. So um, actually what I want this to be is a, an and condition. And of course my laptop is now freezing up. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so you have your token uh, browser here. Here's a current user and the role is going to be in here. It's just a normal token browser, but it's loading pretty much every. Okay, so current user roles. This is what I want to do. And I want to do that on a condition. And I'm going to say, so I don't know if we have a condition for user has roles, but the current user is already in the system. So if I don't have one, I have a user has permission, that's probably better, but role of current user. Okay, and the current user, user role is admin. And then I'm going to negate the condition. The token browser's in the way. Yes. And add a note here. And then here, I'm going to just make this an and. And what this does now is it says, okay, is the user, is the current user an admin? And if they are, then we're going to negate the condition and the model's going to end and it won't set the form error. Um, and so 
hit save, and we'll see if the phone rings. <laughs> All right, so anyway, that's essentially what it looks like, and that's one of the big benefits that I see of using ECA is you can make quick changes on the fly through the admin interface uh, and, and see and evaluate what happened before and how you got to that, that point. So getting started, how do, you, how do you get started with ECA? It's a typical, you know, composer require your uh, ECA, and if you want the, the BPMN modeler, BPMN IO is the module there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of sub-modules of ECA, and basically what happens here, so the key thing to know about ECA is um, it shares, it kind of has a conflicting namespace with actions. I think this is going away in ECA2, but core actions has a different base class than ECA actions. And so that means um, if you want to have an ECA action which has some nicer forms and some more validation, um, as if you're providing a plugin for this as a developer um, and you turn it on and it extends the ECA base, but you don't have ECA on, your site will blow up. Um, so there you'll find that most modules will, if they're providing actions for ECA, they're gonna have a sub-module uh, that does the integration to provide those plugins in their own namespace and keep it all clean and, and working. Um, so you can enable the ones that you need and they just then put in hooks for all the events in there and make the actions available. Uh, go to the uh, admin configuration workflow ECA create model. And then here are the basic building blocks. So going back to, um, not the live site anymore, uh, when you, I thought I'd spend a touch of time just sort of explaining what, how these work, because it's a bit of a visual you know, lear learning curve. Um, that's another benefit that I don't know if you saw the message in there, but ECA is currently disabled on this site with a global kill switch. So th there's that support, uh, kind of like migrations. Uh, so basically a circle is an event that starts off the whole process. And these events uh, are plugins and they're actually super easy to create if you're a developer. We won't go into that, but uh, it's a whole bunch of them that are available just out of the box with, with these. Um, so that's the general thing. Actually, before I even start on that, so this canvas, if nothing is selected, you, you have, it's kind of like the old school Visual Studio, if anybody ever used that, uh, this properties tab here for configuring everything. And one of the things that I always recommend is start by giving it a model, uh, or give it a, a name example, well, this will be what it's saved as, and change the machine ID, because this is what's used in the config uh, name when you export it, and it makes it so much easier to have an actual human readable name there. Um, so you start with the, uh, the event, um, and then off of that, there you can add other things. So the, the, the square is an action, and so that's the, the second big building block. And the actions are uh, basically everything, everything that goes between each of these elements is carried forward in a token. And ECA has under the hood a, a special token for lists, uh, a data transfer object that uh, allows and it does a little bit of magic with that where if you give a, a list of objects to, uh, to an action and the action expects an entity and that list has that type of entity, it'll actually execute that, that action on every entity in the list for you, which is kind of a, a, a really nice thing <laughs> when, you're, when you're dealing with, with all sorts of things. So, um, so with all of these, you can give it a name, put names on these labels, and they show up all visible. Uh, in, the, in the little template here, you can search for everything. So there's a bunch of little tips and tricks around uh, using these effectively. And again, it all comes out of uh, what is the, uh, the starting event that you're, you're coming from. And so one of the things that if we just pick one of these, one of the, some of the nice things in here, I'm just gonna grab, oh, that's a pre-configured one. Let me 
do one that is more from ECA. Okay, so if we just pick one, there's a little link to the documentation uh, that takes you out to ECA's documentation site where there's a ton of examples. Um, it's still kind of bare bones, but there's a lot of stuff that's going in here and a lot of work being done all the time. This tells you the name of the starting entity, the starting tokens that are available, which is essential when you're doing this. It really helps you get a long ways uh, going. Um, so this will define usually whatever the event is. A lot of the e entity events will provide an entity token regardless of the type. And it'll also put it on, if it's a node, there'll be a node. And so you'd have both entity and node available as tokens that you can use down the model. Uh, and then you just go, go from there. So a, the connectors are paths that execution will take. And right now, it will follow all of them. So if you want to do two things at once, um, it's not exactly in parallel because PHP doesn't work that way. But it is effectively is. And so basically, if you chain things and put them in parallel, it will execute all of the successors. Uh, and so you can draw pictures that follow the logic and the flow of what you want. And so conditions, the third part of that, are the conditions that you put on a particular connector. Uh, and so these work the same as, as you would expect. You just pick a connection or a, a condition and run from there. One of the most often a uh, common conditions to do is just a compare field value or compare scalar values, since all of those fields that are in the entity system uh, can be reached through a token, and just you know going through the token, you can compare that to a value, and those are the, the kinds of conditions that you'll use just all the time. They're just part of your your normal toolbox there, um, and so. Based on that, you know, there, there are definitely custom condition plugins, but I'd say three quarters of the ones we use are either entity field has field value or uh, compare the scalar value and uh, just comparing values of, of two tokens or a token and a, and a particular value. So that's basically the, the bones of it. That's, that's how you get started with ECA. Uh, and then I mentioned already the export and import. So when you're in ECA uh, and you've saved your model um, and you go back to the list, then in your drop button here, you can export a model and it gives you a zip file and then you can import it on another site through the import. You can obviously, it is just normal config that you can push and pull through normal deployment methods as well. Um, but that zip file contains a bunch, like I said earlier, a bunch of extra config beyond just the model. So it'll, it comes with all the config that's kind of referenced by the actions and, and plugins in the model. So uh, some examples. Um, one of the common things that uh, we do all the time are just notifications of one sort or another. Uh, and so I've got a couple of examples of just what they're the looking like here. So um, notify the admin when an account's created. So we've got a, a, a few different triggers here. So a user is created, a user saves the profile, the user logs in, uh, you can see it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we can have uh, models or different flow uh, flows of the code um, combining and sharing some of the same. You know, as long as the flow makes sense, you can chain things together kind of any way that makes sense. So yeah, notify moderators of changes to content. Um, we've had some discussion around that. I've made a custom plugin for sending diffs, and we were talking about it in the Slack room. Um, I'm going to try and bundle that one up to, to contribute back, because that's a convenient thing to just get a list of all of the fields that have changed between the old, uh, original version and the, the new. And to do that, you would start with uh, entity is updated uh, 
uh, event, and then once you have that, there's a token on there for the original, the pre-save, and then the, the regular one, you can compare those values and, the, and, uh, and get your results. Um, another thing that's kind of magical, and uh, not sure I have my head totally around it, but we've used it, <laughs> is uh, rendering. So there are hooks into the, the all sorts of different render uh, things, uh, the fields, views, uh, the views plugins. What we have been using are blocks. And so uh, in this case, uh, this site had a list of, of events. And so some of them were in the past and some are in the future. And they wanted to show on the home page three events. Um, if there were two in the future or more, they would show the first two blocks would be future going forward, the next event and then the following event. And then they also, the third block was going to be the, the most recent event in the past and descending, so opposite sort order. And sometimes they don't have any future events, sometimes they have one. Well, this was a really, turned out to be a really nice way of solving this problem is we could just create a block. So this is a create block event and we give it a, a name and then uh, we loaded a, a two views, a two displays of the same view, the upcoming events and the past events, which had different filters on them and different sort orders, you know, one going for future, one going for past. Uh, that gave us a list of, uh, of events, uh, and we basically created a new list and took the, or, or we, or no, we started with the upcoming events, so that could be zero, one, or two based on the view, and then we did this little loop here to add to, the, to that list the first result of the past event and keep doing that until there were three and then bail out. And then we wrapped it with uh, some wrapper uh, HTML, uh, rendered the whole thing, and closed it. And then this block just shows up in the normal block layout where you could place it wherever you want. Uh, and we did a similar one on here on the same site for some a perpetual calendar of, of blocks. And so what they did for that we had a block type of a, of a calendar month. And so on the home page, they have on this, the, this month and next month always showing up in two block positions. And we also use ECA render for that. This is the site and the result. This is the dev version of it. So in this case, it's all past events uh, sort of descending. But with ECA, we also were able to grab May and June blocks and put them there, and nobody ever has to touch that. It's always the, the current month. And then one of the other options that we really, uh, really want to be doing more of is switching view modes through ECA. I think there is an issue of that, uh, doing that for, for view modes. We have it working for form modes. Um, but I think there is a blocker on view modes right now, and we're missing something missing. I'm not recalling what. Uh, and then tons of other examples, uh, populating any references. Uh, when you save w one item, we use a pre-save hook to load the, uh, load the item that's being referenced and populate a, a back reference to the original uh, for sites where that's useful. Uh, redirects on logins. Uh, for one of our clients, uh, they started with a, a web form, a <laughs> really complicated, uh, it was a web form that was 160 page PDF originally, and we converted it to s a seven page uh, web form. And the problem that they had was that their people, they didn't want anybody logging into the system, and so they're using the anonymous functionality of web forms, but you know, they were in conferences trying to fill out this stuff, and it was not keeping things straight. I'm not exactly sure why, but they had l endless issues of people losing access to the web form they'd already started. So, uh, so we eventually talked them into just have them log in, <laughs> and it makes it so much easier. 
And so for all these web forms that were partially completed, we built an admin system so the, the users could claim their web form if they had access to it, and admins could, uh, could um, find a web form based on uh, stuff that they'd put and assign it to a user. And so that's uh, some of, oh, I didn't get that one in here. Yeah, so, th so it's, it's, it's useful for a ton of stuff. So node access is uh, w another one. So models don't have to be complicated. This one is just uh, determining entity access. Uh, we, the client wanted a, a simple way of adding a list of users to a, a node and uh, giving them edit access, just those users. And, um, and we didn't need node access or content access to do that. It was easier to just give them the field and use ECA to deliver it. And this works really well. It's, it's super simple. Uh, and then, as we had in the, the little screenshot before, a full-blown membership application process, reservation process, um, this is one of my favorites here. So this is for a yacht club that has a, a set of moorage, uh, a set of slips that they have a very rigorous process for who gets the next slip. They're always overbooked, waiting lists all over the place. So they were very strict in their bylaws of, you know, you, you add, get on the waiting list when a slip comes free uh, it n sends out a notification to everybody on the waiting list for that slip type, and they have a week then to accept or uh, or skip that. Uh, and then at the end of the end of that period, the most senior member gets it. And so this is the entire logic behind that uh, application or that process. Um, and so we used a, you know views heavily with this. We also used flag on that for the responses. Um, that was more relevant originally when they were putting in uh, a, a, in their email that we sent to the users a unique link so they wouldn't have to log in to give their answer. Uh, so that, that worked with anonymous uh, callbacks. Uh, and part of what, so a couple of, of things in this that I liked is there, uh, there's an endpoint that we defined that uh, basically is an HTML endpoint, it's slash ECA, and then it's up to you to define after that the parts of the route. And it start, it triggers one of these things. And so that can render a form really easily uh, where they can uh, uh, you know, do whatever it is you want. So we were taking the UUID out of a node and putting it in the link and sending that out uh, and letting them come back to the form. Uh, to, to kind of give their, their, their response. Um, another thing we did is this is emailing, you know, a couple hundred people at a time. And so we queued up the emails to send. Uh, we created a, an easy email template for it and um, took a view and sent the view, all the view results we just dropped in as queue items. And then uh, the queue each item here uh, on cron uh, goes, works through that queue, generates the email, and sends it, and it just, it just works. <laughs> so that's basically the whole model. Um, so a few other tips and tricks. I, these are mostly the things that I've been covering here, using views to get a list of items uh, that, uh, when you use views with ECA, what you get is the base view table. You get the, the entity or the entity ID from the result set. You don't get any of the related items. It doesn't load the whole view. It just gives you a list of entities. Uh, and that's useful for all sorts of things. Uh, queues are a great way of doing things that are computationally expensive and put the, delay the work until no one's actually watching and waiting for things. Logs are a key thing for debugging um, in, in ECA. There's, uh, you can turn the log level up really easily, and it, if you turn it up to debug, you get scads of logs on every run, and it really will tell you exactly what the context is at each, each step and helps you uh, go through it. 
Um, and notes and comments, documentation as you go, that's something that uh, I think you can never do enough of. <laughs> Uh, it's a, the more more trail that you leave for yourself, the the easier it will be to come back later, uh, and so that's that's one of the things that we really like. And then Jurgen just told me yesterday about the ECA log action. Uh, there's an actually an action you can add to your model to turn up the logging uh, and then see really easily, so you can have your logs quiet except for where you're really having trouble, you can just drop in an action to show that. And uh, I, I forgot to mention too, Web Profiler does have some really good integration with ECA. Uh, if you can get it running, I've been having trouble with it recently, installing it on uh, several sites, we're hitting a bunch of conflicts, but when it's working, there's a, a checkbox to turn on ECA collection and then it's uh, in your little footer uh, as you're working with Web Profiler. Um, and then, so ECA1 is has been around for a while. ECA2 just reached alpha. Uh, they just cut that uh, a few days ago. And um, that brings some 10.3 and 11 compatibility. Um, but it's also really putting a lot more into the interface to help guide, validate tokens and guide you on what, uh, what you can put in different places and what's actually available there. Gateways. Uh, gateways is the other main thing. This is not into yet. Uh, the gateways are here, but they don't necessarily do much beyond an, an AND action, a uh, connection. Um, and it's useful visually for uh, showing branching points, but and, and you can drop them in and use them. You just have to put a condition on every arrow coming out of it to, uh, to make it do what you want. Um, and for that reason, we often will d use this just as a graphing tool, even if we're not <laughs> actually hooking it up yet. It's really useful in the planning phase to draw a picture of what this should do, what this functionality should do, and then have a conversation with the client about how to do it. Um, and so what with more gateways and BPMN, the, the main library, there's some variations of different types. There's XOR and there's uh, different, different types of gateways that would just make this, uh, none of it is stuff that you can't do in ECA today, but it might make your models more com compact and uh, a little bit less complex. And that's what I've got prepared. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. I don't know of any, uh, the, so the question was about automated testing and how you would go about doing that uh, with, uh, with ECA. I'm not really aware of anything ECA specific around testing. Uh, we're big fans of BHAT. Uh, and doing that sort of integration uh, user level testing is, is what I would be bringing to that for, for, for this. But we, yeah, we haven't done that extensively. Yes? If you do a normal, uh, so the question is, how is this tracked? How do you, how can you deploy it? When you do a, a, a Drush config export, you actually get two uh, files. There's the model, which is uh, a, a, it's a normal co looking config entity with uh, with the actual logic in it, and then there's a, a a BPMN one that has an XML document that kind of stores the layout, and so that all is there, but I think, I don't know if that file's even required, but you get it if you do a normal config export. Yep, back here. Yeah, so uh, the question is commenting on caching. 
Uh, so nothing really, uh, I don't think there's really any impact on caching. What there is an impact on are events. So there is, uh, when you have an ECA module uh, enabled that has an event, there's gonna be some code that's called. You know, it's two or three lines if there's, if there's nothing actually using it. Um, but the block caching mechanisms all, all work fine. There's an ECA cache submodule that lets you uh, add cache tags and stuff like that. I haven't really had to use that or do anything with it. Uh, caching seems to work as you'd expect. I don't know for sure. I would expect views caching to work uh, the way you have it set there. Uh, if uh, you know, if you turn on one of the views caching options. Uh huh. Okay, so <laughs> I keep forgetting to repeat the, the the question. You'd like to prefetch some data and put it in a cache somewhere for. Uh, um, for later retrieval faster. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know. I would think you could. <laughs> I mean, it seems like there's a lot of stuff in there that, uh, you know, when you're doing a custom module, y you can probably, uh, these days, do a lot of that in ECA. I, I'm not really sure what event that would be. That Yes, uh, thank you. From the audience, uh, Sue's suggesting just having a cron uh, job that uh, goes and fetches the results uh, for of a view. And there is a cron uh, uh, L uh, event in ECA, so that's available right now. And uh, you can, and as well as HTTP stuff, you can fetch an endpoint, you can do all that sort of stuff. It's just connecting all the dots, <laughs> I'll leave up to you. Does it work with Web Form 6? Yeah, that's the current one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what we did the, the, the claim the Web Form stuff on. There's a whole Web Form ECA module that, uh, that lets you access the values of the submissions as well as uh, all the normal entity stuff. Okay, you over here. Uh, the question is, can you do field level access in addition to node level? Uh, yes, you can. There's access, there's all sorts of, uh, the ECA access module has a bunch of different uh, access events uh, available. Um, that, that is one of those th areas where the action at the end is uh, return and access results, and then you can pick whether it's forbidden, allowed, ignored, or whatever. But those only do anything if you started with an access event. So, uh, and so if you're using, an, and that's one of the other things, if you're using endpoints, uh, the, you can create a custom endpoint, it's an HTTP endpoint that anything can call, but you not only create the endpoint, you do have to define an access uh, event on that as well, because core is not happy if, if there's no, if it doesn't know how, how, to, how to gate that permission. So you, you almost always need two events for the, for the endpoint. Um, in the middle here. So the question, the question is performance and scaling compared to custom uh, modules. Um, I think that the action side of things, uh, you're not gonna see any performance uh, issues. There's a little bit of concern about all the events and uh, the event tracking, but I haven't noticed it. We're, we're not running huge sites, but we run a lot of different sites and some of them have traffic and, and it hasn't been noticeable uh, for us at all. Let's see, there's someone back here.
great question. Uh, what's the decision point of using ECA versus writing a plugin for ECA or versus writing a custom module? Um, if you are new to ECA, this is going to take you longer than writing a custom module for sure. Uh, if you know how to do a custom module. If you know your custom, AP, you know the Drupal APIs, you can get there pretty quickly as a, as a coder. And ECA, there's a lot, a lot of things you're gonna hit along the way. It almost always takes us longer until we've done it a few times. Um, so there's, there's a fairly sizable learning curve to, to getting to where this is a, a quick way to go. So that said, though, we've been kind of going all in on ECA. So we write an occasional plug-in. We don't really need to very often. Uh, and we're able to use a lot of ECA as is and now and then write a plug-in for things that we don't have or, or more to for some of those that we just don't want to put all the actions in. There's a, it's a complex workflow, and we just, uh, we'll just wrap it in code. Like we used to do that in rules as well, so same sort of... Same sort of idea. Yes, here in the back there. No, that's, that's great, great to hear. <laughs> so uh, if, if you didn't hear it, the comment was that uh, in the previous event, when the, uh, the uh, previous talk, uh, they said that the big change in 2.0 is uh, streamlining the event handling and pre-generating a list of events to listen to and only responding to those instead of to every event. To, although it wasn't, didn't have a measurable impact, but it's, Hey, it's something. It's all stuff in the right direction. So there was someone else back here. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the question is, is it possible to edit the model outside of Drupal and have, uh, have it get reflected inside Drupal? Um, I don't think there's anything built for that. Um, and given that, I mean, I, you, you can always do the import, the export-import, that, that's there. I don't know of, a, of like a, an endpoint for doing this. Um, yeah, that'd be something to talk to Jurgen about. Yes? If I, let me reword it <laughs> in a way that I think, you, what you're getting at is can you get into trouble by making a recursive uh, model uh, that calls itself and... Uh, Okay, so two different uh, things. So one being the recursive. There is a check against recursive logic. So if you do end up uh, with models that, that call itself at some point, uh, it will it'll error out, it'll fail. Uh, it generally fails silently, and then you have to go see what's wrong. Uh, as far as the order of execution, uh, right now, I think that is not controllable, and it's actually based on the order that the, the nodes were added. 
Uh, and so you can go and edit it in the config file, <laughs> and I've done that a couple of times. But, uh, but right now, yeah, there's no interface for controlling that. You, the, the assumption is they're all gonna run eventually, <laughs> and it's undefined which, but it actually runs in the creation order, the order they are in the config YAML. Yes? Okay, so it sounds like it, it, something they're discussing now and it may be configurable going forward or uh, to be able to set the order of branches uh, in execution. Yes, in the back. The question is, can you set it on a constraint uh, validation instead of a form validation. Uh, I haven't checked that specifically. I haven't used that. I do use a lot of the entity save and entity pre-save events and just uh, throw exceptions that way. I haven't tried using a constraint. I would think it's there. <laughs> there yeah, the form validation is, I think that's the, the only time I've used that form validation uh, action. I'm generally working on the entities uh, instead. That's one of those things where I say it's better to, uh, you still need to know how Drupal works uh, to use this effectively. It's still very much uh, something that y y if, you, if you know all of the, the different APIs within Drupal, you'll be a lot more successful using ECA. I think it is still, it's still a reach for a non-Drupal person to, to use this effectively, but with training and exposure, I think they totally could eventually. <laughs> Any other questions? I guess I'm getting beeped off, no. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.